Okay, so thanks everyone for coming um, to this session where we're going to be exploring how food enterprises are working um, towards food equality in their communities. So we're joined by five guest hubs today. So we've got Rachel from Tama Valley Food Hubs. We've got Tom from Cultivate Oxford. We've got Kate from Slow Food Birmingham. We've got Nick Weir from the OFN admin team who will be talking about the long um, table. Um, yeah, so, um, is that everyone from there? I feel like there was, I feel like there's so many people that are joining us today that there's more. And we've also got Joe Macron from the OFN admin team who's going to be doing a great intro to the session and telling us a bit more about the wider issues um, around food accessibility in the UK. Um, so just to say, if you've got any questions for the, for the speakers as um, they're talking, if you could just put them in the chat box, um, we'll get to them at the end of the session. We're going to have time for a and a um, after everyone's finished speaking. So yeah, if you've got any questions as we're going, please pop them into the chat box. And so yeah, so let's get started. So we're going to start off with Joe, who's going to give us an intro into some of the wider issues around food accessibility in the UK. Passing over to you, Joe. Thanks. Hi, hi all. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to introduce this webinar on the topic of food equality and how enterprises and individuals involved in the Open Food Network um, can um, help ensure a greater degree of food equality in my in their local communities. I will start by first by introducing myself, Joe McLaren. I have experience as a food poverty uh, researcher. Um, I was involved in Good Food Oxford as the End Hunger Campaign um, research intern. I've also presented at academic conferences on the topic of alleviating um, food poverty um, through urban agriculture. And I have a master's in agroecology and um, food security um, from um, Coventry uh, University. Um, I volunteer for Oxford Mutual Aid, which is one of the many mutual aid groups set up to deal with the economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, and which receives vegetables from Cultivate Oxford, who Rachel will be speaking. First of all, I feel that it needs to be stated that um, food inequalities or as I like to discuss, being in a state of food poverty is not uh, the fault of the individual, but rather a systemic failure on the part of the uh, food system and the economic system as a whole. At a simple level, food poverty is associated with having not enough money to buy food and having to use food banks. As there's a degree of shame associated with using a food bank, five times pe more people who are eligible for food banks are present than actually use them. Um, of course, food poverty is a broader, a sign of a broad situ broader situation of being in uh, uh, poverty and it's a spectrum. However, it's also a sign that the food poverty is uh, not able to ensure, ensure everyone ha can have a healthy diet. Um, the concept of food from nowhere, coined by activist Jose Bove, accurately describes the cheapest food that is on offer, that rather than being nutrient dense, is calorie dense and has multiple ingredients that could be produced anywhere in the world. The opposite is, of course, the concept of food from somewhere, which is nutrient dense. However, it's not particularly filling, necessarily filling or particularly cheap and tends to be more expensive. And it's not an option for those with uh, very little money. It's not an accident that the cheapest food is highly calorie dense. Since World War II, when Britain nearly starved, uh, what's described as a uh, productive this model of agriculture which uh, puts agricultural productivity above all else was um, created. The fact that the economic model throughout the global north is one of neoliberalism which to a greater or lesser extent puts pro favours profit above all else um, were 
um, has a strong influence on the food system. This is, of course, what the producers here are speaking about. We'll be doing something really important by providing nutrient dense food at reduced or free prices. Uh, this could be considered a radical and uh, progressive act. This is something we want to um, support and encourage here at the Open Food Network. And our goal is to help create innovations to that make this easier and as fair as possible for everyone involved. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, things were not ideal. In the city of Oxford alone, 2,624 food bank referrals were made in 2019. And indicators of uh, lower level food poverty were high with um, 12, 11% of uh, people being deprived defined as income deprived, indicating at least mild food poverty, including 12.45% of children. It's necessary to point out here that there are no official markers of um, food poverty. Since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the Trussell Trust has forecast a 61% increase in food bank usage between October and December, and an 89% increase was reported in the first few months of the pandemic. However, amidst the misery and deprivation, ideas that were never considered before are starting to get gain significant credence. Suddenly, rather than just being a concept that was a preserve of academics and people on the left, the concept of mutual aid has become present in um, public discourse, as has interest in other uh, things such as pay it forward uh, schemes. Examples include the many mutual aid groups, which run on a different model and run on the premise that anyone who can who requests food will receive it. And of course, some of the pay it forward schemes we will hear about. Similarly, um, interest in online buying and organic food has increased uh, significantly start of the pandemic, partly uh, due to a desire to avoid um, catching COVID-19 and partly due to the uh, restrictions placed upon individuals. Um, it may be that in the near future, to paraphrase Antonio Gramsci, that dual power could be um, created by this increased interest in organic food, which changes the food system from below towards a more positive and ecological one. However, dreams aside, one has to stay in the present and note the work that the uh, five speakers um, will be discussing to increase uh, food uh, equality and reduce food poverty in uh, their communities. Um, we have um, Cultivate Oxford, Slow Food Birmingham, Cambridge um, Food Hub, and um, I believe uh, somewhat uh, Nick from the uh, Long Table, and finally uh, Rachel from uh, Tamar Grey Local, who I am proud to introduce and we'll talk next. Thanks for that, Joe. Hello everyone, um, I'm Rachel from Tamar Grow Local and uh, we are based on the Devon Cornwall border. Um, our setting is rural but we also do a lot of work with the wider area, urban area around Plymouth and thought the introduction that Joe gave was really interesting um, and I'd just like to add in something to that if that's okay around the term that we seem to use a lot is food insecurity um in our area there's a lot of self-employed people um there's, it's an area of very low wages um and those kind of things we're finding are causing a lot of food insecurity especially this year as a result of covid um where work is much more um insecure especially for those groups um but also um we're also seeing a lot of food insecurity where family breakdowns happen, where there's mental and physical health issues, um, rural services, 
Um, so that could be public transport, um, delays in receiving benefits, knowledge and skills, and um, security of housing as well, which can all um, play a big part um, around accessibility to um, food and local food in, in particular. Um, we've been working around themes of food poverty and food insecurity for about the past five, six years now. Um, and that work has grown out of very close relationships that we have built with both um, local housing provider in Plymouth, Plymouth Community Homes and Plymouth City Council. Um, it's grown from building relationships with local schools, um, local, um, our local food producers and also um, networks in Plymouth as well, including Food Plymouth and um, they have created a food poverty network in Plymouth that we're part of. Um, I work with Plymouth City Council and um, Plymouth Community Homes. Um, we created a project um, called Grow Share Cook, um, which was a project in Plymouth in year one, looking at food insecurity, um, where we deliver out um, bags of vegetables um, every fortnight to, it was up to 100 recipients at that point. Um, it was a Plymouth City Council and Cities of Service project. It was very successful um, and it had a very high return on social invest, very high social return on the investment that was put into the project um, and had a very direct um, impact on people accessing local food as well as um, increasing knowledge around cooking um, and growing. And it was also supported with a um, project around energy saving, um, which is also a really important theme to run around alongside food um, because quite often the choice is heating or eating, um, which we're finding a lot, especially now we're going back into winter. Um, the COVID situation this year has really shown that food um, poverty and accessibility really is reaching all areas of the local community, um, rural and urban. So we found that our work is a lot more kind of coming into the rural areas this year than just Plymouth. Um, but what we're doing along with our partnerships that we've built um, and using OFN in particular is that we um, are using a pay it forward project for so people our customers can buy a veg bag for a family in need um, or just provide a donation um, and we've been distributing those bags this year through um, uh, the schools in Callington our local town where we've been um, during the school holidays creating fruit bags and veg bags. Um, we also deliver to the soup run in Plymouth and to the Salvation Army. Um, we've been continuing our Grow Share Cook project and we are about to start a project in Plymouth this Christmas um, called Plymouth Feeder Family at Christmas where we'll be supplying vegetables. Um, we, the, the vegetables that go into the bag we source as from our local producers as much as we can. Um, we don't ask them to discount their projects. It feels very important to us at Tamar Grow Local that we're still supporting our local food producers as much as we can. And we're not asking them to discount their food for, for this means. But so it's, we're kind of trying to keep it holistic as possible that it supports everyone. Um, another couple of things we're doing, we also signed up to the Healthy Start vouchers um, which is a national scheme so we can accept them through OFN so um, and then we can claim back the, the money um, and that we haven't had a huge take up on that at the moment but it's something we're going to be promoting further in um, 2021 because apparently in in our local area there hasn't been full take up of the available vouchers anyway so we hope we can work with Cornwall Council on that. Um, another thing we do to try and keep the food hub as accessible as possible is that we run free collection points um, around the valley and also in Plymouth. Um, so customers can collect for free with no minimum order at all. And I think that's really important to be keeping um, our offering as accessible as possible. 
um, and keeping those um, collection points in accessible places. So they might be um, in a place where people gather, they might be at the end of a public transport route. Um, so just to kind of make sure that they can be accessible and at useful times to, to work out for people as, as best as possible. Um, we're not, we, we run our food hub on a zero waste system. So we don't, we often get asked if we have excess produce that we can pass on. Um, we don't have excess produce because everything is picked to order and brought into us. Um, but we do ask our producers if they do have anything different that's that's not through our um, delivery routes and they want to donate them, then we can help pass them into um, the places where we can uh, drop off to the Salvation Army or the soup runs. Um, and our, but we've been really pleased with how our customers have responded to the pay it forward veg bag and pay it forward donations. It's been really successful um, and it's enabled us to add value to projects that Plymouth Community Homes have brought to us or the local council have brought to us or the schools um, so we can really support them and, and make a difference. Um, yeah. That's great. Thanks so much uh, for sharing, Rachel. I'm um, going to pass on next to Alice from Cambridge Food Hub. Um, Alice, are you here? Sorry, just looking through there. No, it's all right. I am here in my awesome. room. Um, should I just go for it? <laughs> yeah, yes, please. Thank yeah. you. Um, so there's actually a lot of overlap between what we do and some of the things that Rachel said, which I suppose is not a surprise. Um, we are just a brief introduction Cambridge Food Hub based in Cambridge, so a small um, small town, uh, well, small town, small city, I guess. Um, and also, according to a study that was done a few years ago, the most unequal city in the UK, because obviously we have a lot of um, people who are quite well off, but also particularly in the north of Cambridge, there's high levels of deprivation and also in um, some of the villages that surround Cambridge as well. Um, so some of the things we do are quite similar. So we support Cambridge also has a um, food poverty alliance, which is, um, as Rachel said, for, for their area, it's a combination of representatives from local charities, um, housing groups, the local council, um, etc. And they uh, work to support people who are experiencing food poverty or food insecurity. Um, so there are some projects that are done that we don't run ourselves, but Cambridge has a good network of um, uh, kind of community groups that are looking to support people and they run these things called community fridges, which I'm sure some other um, you know, people here might know of in their own areas. <clears throat> um, at the beginning of the year of 2020, we had one community fridge in Cambridge. Uh, now we have 11 and most of that is because of um, the impact of coronavirus and people in their various um, wards kind of coming together to set these up in local communal spaces. Um, and these community fridges are similar to a food bank, except you don't need to be referred. So um, I think kind of the feedback that people get is that they're um, spaces that feel, people feel less shame to go into, I suppose. Um, because anybody from the community can access them, the food is, is free, you don't need to be referred, and it's just people in the community looking out for other people in the community. Um, so we don't run these, but we do um, support them with donations. Um, something, that, um, something that we uh, are able to do as a um, business that... Um, you know, because because we, unlike some of the other OFN enterprises, do business to business trade. Um, and we have essentially said to all of our retail customers that if there is anything ever that they want to donate, um, then at the same time as we make a delivery to them, we will pick up this donated produce and um, or, or products, dried goods as well, and then um, take them to, to the community fridges. So the point there being that it's very um, efficient because we're visiting these places already and we just add on the donations as a final stop in the route so it saves volunteer time in having to go to those different retailers. Um, the other uh, overlap I guess with what Rachel was saying is with regards to the healthy start vouchers um, because we recently set up a 
scheme that's like fully about them <laughs> um and um that's because our kind of partner business is the Cambridge Organic Food Company which is a organic fruit and veg um box delivery service so deliver to people's houses um and as you can imagine like it's that's not cheap it's not like if you're kind of on the bread line where you may be sourcing your fruit and veg from but also we did feel that um it's it's really and also it's local produce so it's really great quality food that we think should be accessible to more people and we've had people in the past leaving the box scheme because they can't afford it and it's something that people will um stop if they're trying to uh like save costs in in an area um the reason why we set it up uh, so Cambridge Organic has always accepted um, healthy start batches for many years and as Rachel said not had any particular particularly strong uptake in that um, but we do think it is a really important benefit because it's one of the few benefits that's fully focused on access to fruit and veg um, and I think I mean I might be cynical here but I don't think I'm too cynical that um, you know benefits are made especially difficult to access and um with the hope being that if fewer people access them then um there'll be reason for scrapping them um, so we think it's really important that people do access this benefit <laughs> and part of our reason for setting up a healthy start veg box delivery service was specifically to promote this benefit to highlight it to people um, who do qualify for it and to offer some support in them accessing it. Um, so the Healthy Start Vegetable Scheme, it's very simple. We, as Rachel said, and this is another thing I totally agree with, we um, are, are not expecting our producers to kind of um, sell their things for less. So we have a box that we, we know the cost price of, um, and it's about five pounds. And then we say that, um, um, people use the Healthy Start voucher to contribute towards that. Um, and we cover the additional costs of associated with packing and delivering that box. Um, with the point being that actually for us, it is not particularly high cost because we're already doing a delivery round and they will slot into that delivery round. So they get a box that's exactly the same quality as any of our other customers. Um, so it's not you know the waste products <laughs> it is exactly the same quality and it's delivered in exactly the same way but it is subsidized by us and it is and they do contribute towards it with the healthy start vouchers um and uh when we started that scheme we did find the uptake was quite slow um because we asked people to contribute a, a small like um one pound membership towards it which we hope kind of increases um like investment in the scheme i guess um, and also so it doesn't feel like it's just like a donation. Um, we thought maybe it was it was that that was preventing, but actually talking to the um, people that are kind of on, on the front line in, in the community fridges, they said that the main barrier is lack of awareness about these vouchers and um, difficulty in accessing them. So um, we're also hoping to do a, Big push in the new year as well because we've heard that the system will be moving fully online so it should be easier to apply for the vouchers um but with some more targeted um kind of advertisement particularly with um schools and nurseries because that's the kind of age group that you need to have kids at to get these vouchers we have had people calling us up and saying oh this is, this is interesting i think i'm eligible how do i access them and so we're hopeful that it's actually having an impact in terms of reaching the right people. And um, like I said, another key motivator is increasing uptake of this benefit so that it actually um, is shown to be valuable. And I do appreciate that just like a few families in Cambridge might, might not make the, a massive difference, but I guess it's the principle of it, that there are people out there who should be receiving the support but aren't. And um, we, want, we want to help them in doing that really um so yeah i guess those those are kind of um the main things that we do um we support projects that are happening in cambridge and then we run our own scheme in this way to try and help um it is a targeted group of people um you know it's people with young kids uh who are on certain benefits um to receive the support um 
yeah, so that's, that's some of the things that we do. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Alice. It's really interesting to hear your plans for proactive outreach um, around the comms for the Healthy Start vouchers. So thanks for sharing. Um, I'm just going to take this point just to say if anyone has any questions for our speakers today, just pop them in the chat. We'll have time at the end for a QA. and a um, So just as people are talking, if, you, if any questions come up, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, so yeah, thanks again, Alice. And we're going to move on now to uh, Kate from Slow Food Birmingham. So handing over to you, Kate. I've, um, if you want to share your screen, I've enabled that. So awesome, thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, I um, am sharing my screen and apologies for the photograph. I've, um, I have a face that's in the middle of um, some skin cancer treatment. So I'm not a very attractive lady at the moment. <laughs> so, um, Slow food is probably a little different um, in our approach is that we didn't start out just as a food hub. We started out as a, as a slow food group as part of the international slow food movement. And, um, and good, clean and fair food for all is, is the big part. Well, it's, it's the catchphrase of what, what slow food hangs on. Um, and the for all is incredibly important for me and, um, and I think because of that, it's very much a focus of Slow Food Birmingham. Um, and then this year we have we've really started to look at the the not just the good and the clean, but what the fair um, involves. Um, and so, as a new group, we set out to bring. Um, local and seasonal food to people and we set up a food hub with the intention that people had to actually arrive and um, collect their orders at a local pub which gave us um, a bit of a, an opportunity to talk about what slow food was about. Um, we referred to it as our farm shop in the city um, and those of you who know me um, will know that I talk about Birmingham as um, the UK's second city as um, the black hole in the middle of this beautiful luscious do food donut. Um, there are no independent retail stores in the jewelry quarter, which is um, um, affectionately known as the village on the edge of the city. Um, it, it's, a, it's a growing residential area. And um, so that is what we actually set out to do. Um, and we thought it would be super easy. Um, of course, we, we, we knew who the, um, the farmers were. We just had to ask them to bring their produce in. Um, but it didn't uh, turn out to be that easy. Um, it took us six months to find the producers who wanted to bring, um, bring their food in. Um, and, and then we had to build that community from scratch. Um, and what we found is using Open Food Network has been really, really helpful to do that. Um, and um, it because we do pick up is how we have enabled to have that that um, those weekly conversations with people about the fact that you're not going to get tomatoes at this time of the year, and that um, we the salt that we sell is is a lot more expensive than the salt that you will buy in a supermarket because it's made in Droitwich and it's the salt that's being made for the first time in a hundred years. And I suppose then you're all sort of going, okay, well, how does this fit in with, um, with the, the conversation? And the reality is that when COVID hit, we tripled our numbers um, of orders and we realised that we needed an army of volunteers. So food is 100% uh, volunteer run. So we do price ourselves a little differently because we don't charge for packing and things like that. Um, but what we found was that we did we'd already built this community um and and it was fantastic to see people step up um we then had a phone call from one of our producers who said that um he had been left with a field or two fields full of potatoes um and could we help out because he didn't want the food to, to rot um and we instigated the potato project. We sold 11 tonnes of potatoes for 10 pounds a uh, for 10 kilos. 
eight of those kilos went into the food emergency groups that we were working with um, and people collected in lovely slow food tote bags, um, two kilos. Um, that was our first foray really into working um, with food justice. Um, and, and what we realized was that because we were talking to our shoppers, not just about their produce and things like that, they were really ready to step up and, and help out. Um, and so we started to have a conversation with them about the fact that this is not food poverty that is the big problem. It is the food dignity um, and that people who are in food crisis could be you and I. Um, and the amount of people that we met who had lost jobs, who had never had to, um, had to ask for help before, um, it, it's been heartbreaking. Um, so one of the things that we did as we chatted to people was we worked with Incredible Surplus um, and um, they had crazy deliveries of things. As you can see, there's a mountain of beautiful French brie over here and we've got lovely um, preserved lemons and things like that. These are not things that would normally go into a, um, a food emergency bag. So we actually ask our shoppers when they arrived if they'd like to purchase something from us um, with a contactless uh, payment. And then when we were doing the potato project, we sold them potatoes as well. Um, we then realised that we had a real opportunity to do something um, that wasn't just um, selling potatoes, it wasn't just talking to people about food, that we had a bit of a platform and we've been working to try and bring a project called Bags of Taste into Birmingham. And so we, we started asking our um, our shoppers if they'd like to put something towards the Bags of Taste program, uh, which to our pleasure, uh, we've just completed the first, um, the first pilot um, of the project. And um, some of the photographs you can see, we've got a great team of volunteers who put all the ingredients together um, and some amazing meals that have been cooked by the, um, the 36 participants. That project is now in the post, um, in the pipeline of being funded by Birmingham Health. So we've shown that there was a real need. Um, it's not our our strength is not to run the program, but our strength is in highlighting it. I think that Slow Food really believes that we are we're lobbyists, um, and because of the potato project and and we did receive a massive amount of uh, of coverage from people we had a lot of allotment um, growers and community gardens coming and saying to us can we donate um, our veg to you so that then we became the pipeline and the funnel to um to be able to access access that in the meantime We've had some members who have set up a gleaning network and they're working with the producers that we work with um, and that we, we pick up from each week. And they're going to start collecting, uh, going through their fields and collecting surplus. We're talking to some other producers about setting up CSAs. And we're also um, looking um, and talking to, to other producers about starting some healthy start veg box schemes. So it's been a bit of a, um, a, an amazing year. And then we hit October midterm break. And, and until that point, this was more of a, um, an ideological thing. It was a way that people could feel that they could pull together and things like that. But when we hit October mid midterm break and we learnt the, st the stat that every day that a child goes hungry, they lose a week of attainment at school by the age of 16, that accounts to a year, it really did get political. Um, we, we pulled Liam Byrne, who um, is um, a candidate for, for mayor, into the program. We asked everybody um, to pay it forward. The pub that we um, we used for our pickups cooked meals. We we sent over two hundred bags out in that midterm break. Um, 
what we what we did is has been just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to what Birmingham's done. Um, we are part of a new project called Brum Together. Um, and this year they have uh, delivered 80,000 meals and bags, but there's 80 different groups working together now. Um, so when I, when I say that the, the pay it forward that we've put through um, on, on our food hub has raised 2,000, I think that we're getting closer to 2,500 at the moment. Um, it has been a tip of the iceberg of what's happened in Birmingham. Um, and, and I think that we're really showing that if we work together with other groups, we're much stronger. Um, so what we have done on Open Food Network is there is never a point in time when the pay it forward meals are closed. So when our weekly um, ordering system is on, it's at the top of our, um, our offering. And when the orders close, this offer gets turned on. So at any particular point in time, if somebody goes through to the Slow Food Birmingham um, Open Food Network site, they, they will always get an opportunity to be able to play it forward. Um, and I think that as, as, as our other speakers have said, and I'm sure that the other speakers uh, will say, that there is so much overlap about what we, can, what we are doing um, as a nation and I think that what we need to do is we need to think about how we can continue that and the changes that we've seen and the calls that we've seen this year how we can then um, how we can continue to pay that forward as, as we move out of COVID times. Thank you. That was great thank you so much Kate what an inspiring share. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Um, I'm going to pass on now uh, to Tom um, from Cultivate Oxford. So if you're ready, Tom, I think you've got some slides too. So I'm just going to check that you can share them. Thank you. Um, I'll try. Okay. Yes, I'm still, I'm just not capable of screen sharing at the moment, but. Um... Um... Oh, no, now it's become available. Hold up. Okay, cool. Great. Amazing. Can everybody see this all right? Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. Great. Amazing. Thanks, Kaylee. Well, um, uh, yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks for welcoming, welcoming me to uh, this panel. Um, my name's Tom. I'm um, one of the uh, directors of Cultivate Oxford, which is um, a community cooperative um, based in Oxford. We've been around for about, uh, for almost 10 years now. Um, and over that time, um, Cultivate has had lots of different uh, forms and lots of different business models within it. Um, when Cultivate started, it was growing its own food um, at a farm, which is a, one of the images you can see here. Um, we also had several different veg vans and food from that farm and other local producers would, um, would, would be in that van and we'd stop at different places around the city as well. Um, we had several different um, pickup points. Um, we would attend farmers markets, lots of different things like that. Um, we, we, like I say, we are a community cooperative. So we have uh, around 400 members. Um, uh, about 200 of them came from a share issue um, about 10 years ago through our, through our legal form of Community Benefit Society. And um, over the years, we, we've gathered um, sort of annual members of around 200 on, a, uh, on an annual basis as well. Um, we don't exclusively sell to customers though. We are a community cooperative. And so we sell to both uh, members and, and sort of the general public as well. Um, thing I, the reason I wanted to just give you a brief bit of context is that um, I think one of the interesting things about Cultivate is the most permanent feature of it is probably its impermanence. So we don't actually, we don't do the farm anymore. We had to drop that for financial reasons. Similarly, vans have broken down over time and we've not been able to replace them. And the model that we've got today is very, very different from how it started up um, uh, in, uh, in 2012. Um, where we're at today um, I, is, um, yeah, like I say, very, very different. Our model today um, still involves um, going to a farmer's market. So we tend to farmer's market um, once a week in Summertown, if you, if you know Oxford, um, uh, through which we make sales to um, you know, retail customers and our members. Um, uh, 
that is the, the food that we sell is almost exclusively from from producers in and around the county so um, we've got about 30 supplies throughout the year um, the bigger thing though that we do and that has been really enabled by open food network is to expand our sort of retail veg box offering um, we, before covid we uh, were doing around 25 customers a week um, it was a very sort of um, early stage uh, sort of business really idea um, and within about three weeks, we were doing 250 customers a week. So uh, a sort of tenfold increase. This The, the image I've got here is um, one of, um, uh, we, we, we had lots of people come to us and um, uh, give, a, you know, give us resources and their time and, and all these sorts of things. This is actually a, a barn in a farm just on the edge of Oxford. That, um, one of our directors had access to. So um, we filled that bar with uh, lots of different boxes and had to sort of totally reorganize our systems. People were flocking to us to sort of volunteer and help out as they were sort of furloughed and also were working, looking for work as well. Um, we've, we've since sort of, um, whilst we went up to 250, we actually dropped down to 150 a week and we're now leveling out at about 200, uh, 200 boxes a week again. But um, uh, one of the strange things about COVID has been actually this, a uh, strange expansion. It was nice to hear from, I think it was Kate uh, in the last talk who said they had a sort of threefold increase. Um, so sorry to trump you on that, Kate. Our tenfold increase was was challenging, but we've we've done it. Um, uh, anyway, I'm gonna, uh, I know this talk is about sort of poverty and, um, and food poverty and how hubs are responding to them. Um, just want to tell you a quick story. So uh, I've not always lived, lived in Oxford, but um, uh, I moved here about four years ago um, and um, uh, like many places um, in the UK, there are um, areas of poverty. Um, Oxford can be thought of as a sort of fairly affluent area, but there are there are places um, in and around Oxford that do experience some very extreme poverty. And um, when my partner and I were looking for houses in Oxford, um, we started to filter by the price we could afford, and um, the estate agents ended up, ended to, uh, up taking us to the three areas you can see here: uh, Barton. Rose Hill and Blackbird Lees. Um, I actually ended up buying a house in Barton because it's the only place I could afford. But also um, these are the three main areas in Oxford where there are very high levels of, of uh, poverty, food poverty included, but um, uh, all the other forms of poverty that um, everybody will be familiar with. Um, so yeah, like I say, you can see me in that sort of top, uh, top, hand, uh, top right hand circle. And that's where I am right now. Um, uh, Joe earlier also spoke a little bit about um, some of the uh, some of the sort of uh, poverty stats in uh, Oxford as well. And um, uh, yeah, um, there are several thousand people in Oxford who are experiencing food poverty every every day. And I'm going to come on to some of the ways that I think we're trying to um, help address these. Um, I just want to say one thing about our model as well. So. Um, uh, I sometimes I think about cultivate as a, a social enterprise. We're a cooperative, and which is a form of social enterprise. And I've noticed over the years that um, there are often I, I probably put three different categories of ways in which um, social enterprises make their social difference. I think the first way is um, you know you can generate loads of revenue and loads of uh, loads of financial surplus, and then donate that money to a to a, a cause that you think uh, is worthwhile. I think the second way is to um, uh, make sure that the product that you're doing, the product that you're making um, causes that causes that social good to take place. So a really good example of that is um, uh, fair trade products. So, you know, when you buy a fair trade product, you're ensuring that the social good occurs. Um, and I think the third way is usually around the sort of existence of that social enterprise. So um, a good example of that is, um, you know, say the, the community owned village shop, um, because of its existence, it stops, you know, Mrs. Norris going lonely um, uh, when she, she goes and buys her shopping there once a month. I'd say that um, the reason I raise those three things is because I want to say that I think the way that um, Cultivate goes around um, making its difference in food poverty is not necessarily through 
direct projects or that sort of thing. It's more embedded into the work that we do. And I think you probably see it through those last two forms. So we build it into um, our overall business model, as well as, um, you know, hopefully our very existence being a, a point of difference for uh, people experiencing food poverty. Um, Nice. Um, so I just got three quick examples um, of some things I think we're doing um, around food poverty here. Um, I'm going to start off with the more boring ones and about governance and then they will get sexier, I promise. But um, uh, the um, uh, one of the things we've been so I've mentioned we're a cooperative and one of the things that we've um, sort of uh, been exploring re recently is how we can build um, cooperativism into um, several different bits of our work um, and um, cooperativism can happen both at a, a membership level as well as um, a board level as well as an operational level as well and um, certainly at a board level we've been trying to practice sociocracy which um, I won't go into it now but it's a way of sort of um, doing shared decision making amongst the, share, the stakeholders who are involved in that decision um, and similarly we've been bringing in sociocratic um, uh, principles to um, the operational team as well um, and the way that sort of ex expressed itself recently is that we've recently um, adopted an the Oxford living wage for everybody who um, uh, who works for Cultivate Oxford and we've got a fairly large team now especially due to the Covid um, response but um, we um, we had to take on volunteers initially because we couldn't work quickly enough when when uh, when the increase in veg boxes was happening but you've converted several of those volunteers into paid staff who um, have either uh, been out of work because their jobs have gone or um, you know um, need need top-ups to their income because because they're reducing the, the number of hours that they work um, uh, and so I'm really pleased that um, several we call um, our packers and our, and our uh, market staff grocers and all of our grocers are now earning an Oxford living wage. The reason I think that's important is because we think it's really, really crucial that um, uh, people have can have dignity in sort of being able to purchase the sort of food products they have through the salary that they earn. Um, the Oxford living wage is £10.21 an hour, which I think is significantly higher than uh, what uh, the, the national living wage, I, I don't know what it is, but um, uh, it's expensive to live in Oxford and we're really pleased that we're helping our team members and us and our staff to be able to afford the things that they, uh, they need to be able to live. Um, amazing. Um, second way we, and uh, second way we go about tackling food poverty is through working with um, lots of um, local partners. Um, uh, Joe earlier mentioned Oxford Mutual Aid. Joe, if you're still about, do you just want to briefly just tell everybody what Oxford Mutual Aid is? Yeah, sure. Uh, so Oxford Mutual Aid uh, was uh, set up at the um, start of the uh, first lockdown uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic because it became clear that there was an increase in uh, food poverty through people losing their jobs being on furlough or falling through the gap. So the purpose of Oxford Mutual Aid is to make sure that um, anyone who requests it has a meal every week and, um, well, ha gets given a food parcel each week. And um, unlike food banks, you can uh, sign up for as many food parcels as you need. And it has a lot of volunteers, including me. I volunteer a couple of hours a week for them. Um, yeah yeah thanks joe i think that's it does it does it a really good description um we um so as part of our weekly market we we try our best to um predict uh, how much food we're going to sell at the weekly market um but we often have have leftovers which are still great and fresh uh, and decent food um but um uh we think it's important that that food from the producers in the county goes to uh, people who who need it most and each Sunday after the market Oxford Mutual Aid come and collect a fairly decent portion of that food and use it to provide um, uh, often uh, reheatable meals for um, several hundred people locally um, in and around um, some of those areas that I mentioned earlier in Oxford. Um, I was at uh, one of the one of the um, centres that um, 
uh, one of the one of the kitchen centres that um, uses and cultivates food is um, it's called Donington Doorstep. And when I dropped it off at Donington Doorstep, um, the, our, our surplus food about a month ago, there was two volunteers in there, um, Alex um, and and a, a colleague of his, and they they were midway through making about 170 uh, reheatable meals for. Um, uh, lots of people locally so again I'm really pleased that the food that um, uh, that we get you know that's being produced in Oxford is going to some of the uh, people who um, really need it most um, in and around the city. Um, the final thing um, I just want to come to is just around um, uh, our food producers as well. I mentioned we've got around 30 food producers that we um, procure from throughout the year. Um, we don't procure from them consistently throughout the year because of seasonality but um we um one of the things that i didn't say in the sort of oxford context is that um uh, whilst we operate in the city we also have um a lot of um impact on the sort of um the rural areas of the county of oxfordshire and most of our food producers are based in the county um several of them are trying to make a living from good food production and um, a few of the ones you can see on here are either, um, I wouldn't say exclusively, we're not exclusively buying from, but Blackland Organics, for instance, that you can see at the bottom there is um, uh, we are, uh, we, we, we almost exclusively take all of Jamie's um, food produce and we pretty much ensure his living, um, which uh, is really, really pleasing. So again, just coming back to that message of embedding, um, embedding our our food poverty um, sort of uh, resilience um, into our practice. Um, we make sure that we are buying from people who want to make a living from good food production and ensure that they can get the food that they need as well. Um, excellent. The final bit, this is just a very, uh, This is, I, I just want to take advantage of the fact that um, there's several people on this call and, and to uh, take an opinion. Um, several years ago, I was involved with a piece of work that um, came, that. Uh, uses Alexandra Rose uh, vouchers. These are vouchers that are very similar for, to, um, you know, there's sort of national food vouchers, but you can actually use them um, at market stalls as well. And I've been exploring recently um, uh, whether or not Cultivate could bring Alexandra Rose vouchers um, to Oxford. Um, the reason I wanted to ask a question about this, because I'm always a bit hesitant about food vouchers, you know, I, I feel, and I'm sure this has been picked up from the presentation that, um, you know, that um, the best way to give people dignity and the best pay way to um, uh, ensure people can get the stuff they need is actually to pay them a decent wage and pay them a decent livelihood. Um, uh, and I think food vouchers are probably a, a cause of, you know, some very fat cat salaries at the, at the high end of organisations for getting to resource um, workers um, and, and, you know, compensate workers for, for, their, for their hard work at lower end of the organisation. Um, so I guess my question is, is you know, do, 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 do we think that food vouchers should or could be adopted into the food hub sort of systems that um, you know, uh, Cultivate and several of the other speakers um, have, um, have sort of uh, spoken about as well, the impact that we're making? I don't know whether it should be a piece of practice that we do or not, essentially. Um, so yeah, maybe we can discuss that later, but um, that, that's all I've really got to say, um, apart from that, you know, I think that, um, you know, it was really inspiring hearing everybody else talk and, um, you know, food poverty, it's, um, it's part of one of the, um, one of the many forms of poverty that many people experience. The estate that I live on, just to bring it back to here, you know, it's um, about 80% council um, owned, um, and uh, I'm one of the few sort of, sort of private owners here, but, um, one of, the, one of my favourite things over the last year has been getting to know my quite elderly neighbour um, who um, has only lived in Barton all her life um, and when we moved in had never even tasted a courgette. Um, I'm really pleased to say that partly thanks to being a neighbour and partly having to be, you know, from having been involved with Cultivate Oxford, um, Lynn, uh, our neighbour last year, grew her very own courgette plant and tasted it. She did spit it out immediately, but I'm really pleased that we actually were able to get her to taste uh, her first ever sort of uh, healthy fruit and veg. So, um, yeah, uh, that's all I've got to say. Um, and yeah, thanks for listening. I'm open for questions.
Thanks, Tom. Um, actually, we've got one more speaker before we move to questions. So thanks so much for your share. There's so many um, interesting points covered. So thanks for that. Um, now, uh, Nick from the OFN team is going to talk a bit about the long table. So Nick, passing over to you. Thank you, Kate. And I know we need to keep it brief because we want time for questions as well. Um, I'm stepping in for Emma and Sheila from the long table. I had an email here from Emma saying that uh, she's stranded with a flat tire and a boot full of herbs somewhere near Miserden, which is just outside Stroud. Uh, would like to have been here, but I'm, I'm covering for her. Um, so inspiring to hear all these stories of the ways people are using OFN to, to move towards food equality. Um, what, what I'm reflecting on is that it, it used to be that that farmers markets were for people who could who, who had scruples and who could afford to pay for you know, local food and that people who were in people who couldn't afford to pay for local food local food would end up at food banks and what we're seeing now is our food hubs that are buying as in kate's words food for everyone and that really excites me with with pay it forward schemes with um i'm, I'm getting a message that's saying that i'm unstable am I, is my video is my audio working okay Kale? um it was a little bit glitchy so maybe you might want to um do this with your video off sorry yeah. nick <laughs> let me know if it's still bad and i'll try something else um so yeah just really glad that we are moving towards food equality let me tell you a little bit about long table um similar to a lot of projects that we've heard about this afternoon um they initially set up uh, the, the long table was actually a literally a long table in a, in a warehouse where they they cooked uh, surplus food from local farmers and growers. Um, people were invited to come along and help cook the food. People who were out of work, people who were homeless came and helped with the, with the preparation. And then everybody, anybody who was interested came and sat down and, and ate the food together. And some people ate for free, some people paid to eat, some people paid and didn't eat. Um, but the whole thing was was just let's all sit down together and have a long table let's sit down and, and share food together obviously the pandemic changed that um their model now is to again source surplus food from local farmers growers and other food producers um some of that food is then distributed fresh uh, but the bulk of it now is is frozen as ready meals and they have a system called freezers of love and the freezers of love are uh, 16 different freezers around the community, some in church halls, some in people's garden sheds, um, some in community centres. Um, and the system is that you can go, anybody can go and take a meal from the freezer and anybody can make a donation. And again, there is no link between the donations and the, and the meals. So some people eat for free, some people pay and don't eat, some people take a meal and, and pay the cost price of it. Uh, some of the freezers have microwaves beside them so people who are homeless can come and take a frozen meal heat it up and eat it on the spot and the way they're using the open food network is in two ways one is to make those freezers of love visible uh, we, we're in the process of setting up a map so that people can can see where these 16 freezers are they can click on the map they can find uh, exactly where it is the contact details when it's open when it's available uh, what's in stock in that particular freezer um, in terms of um, what, whether it's a meat meal, a vegetarian meal, allergens, all that sort of detail. Um, and then either order it online or, or just arrange to, to, to pop in and pick up, um, pick up a meal. And at the same time, the option to make a donation, but there's no link between the, <laughs> the meal and the donation. The second way they're using the open food network is to link with suppliers. So uh, in Stroud, where I'm based, there are probably about 80 different suppliers feeding into the, the Stroud Co food hub. And some of those suppliers will have surpluses. So as well as selling produce through the food hub, they will make surplus produce available to the long table. And it just makes it a lot easier for the long table to know where the surplus courgettes are and where the surplus beans are and, and what is available and they can then arrange to get that produce to the central kitchen, um, again, on a completely donation basis, free basis, and the produce is then prepared into, into ready meals. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. I'm really happy to take more questions, but I know you're tight for time, so let me hand back to you. Great, thanks, Nick, thanks so much. So 
Great, so we've got 15 minutes for questions and we've reached an hour. So if anyone has to leave, including the speakers, please feel free to do so. We'll go on for about 15 minutes um, for questions now, but we aim to finish at quarter two um, on the dot if we can. So I'm gonna open now to any questions. I haven't seen any questions in the chat, although there's lots of nice comments. Um, Can I just make a comment? Is that the way I don't know if anyone can say. I, I've got to go any second because I'm actually in the car park while my daughter's in a um a lesson. So excuse her for stay to me. But talking about um sort of food dignity and things like that, that's how I actually began at at the hub. I mean, I, I can afford food, but during the pandemic it's been, you know, really, really hard. So actually I started off as a volunteer and um ended up we work sometimes for two or three pounds an hour it works out as you know it's very very little but that pays for our for our shopping my children come and help they help to pack when we were all in lockdown and actually that working at the hub enabled us to maintain like you know like a nutrition nutrition dense like eating um to, to keep up the standards and so on so it's you know sometimes it's really nice to offer opportunities to pay it back as well as the opportunity to to pay it forward as you say it doesn't you know not linked not a requirement but um i've got to go because they're opening the doors but thank you ever so much so i've really really enjoyed i've got so much out of today because we're moving into a growing project at the moment which i wish i could talk about but um thanks ever so much it's been brilliant today thanks to all the speakers and um and goodbye <laughs> thank you okay hope you get home get home and get yeah. warm <laughs> i know i'm freezing <laughs> thank you bye 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 Hey, can I come in on a question, a couple of questions on the chat? Um, the question from Errol about um, how to how people who are struggling have access to tech projects. A lot of the food hubs on OFN have what we call phone buddies and phone buddies are people who are willing to take phone calls from people who don't have access to the internet. And then they will place the order and take online payment on behalf of either online payment or arrange for that for that person for the shopper to actually have access to the to the produce for cash or by or by bank transfer or other other means. But the phone buddies actually get around this problem of internet access for people who don't have uh, uh, internet access. And the question from Jade about uh, offering surplus. Um, Producers can offer, will set up their produce on OFN and the producer will set the price of that produce and the producer will then give permission to the hub to sell that produce. So if the producer wants to put up produce that is at zero selling price and then give permission to a particular producer, then that will be visible to the, um, on that shop front. So Nick, Nick, does the producer only offer that surplus produce to the long table where it offers it to anybody who wants it how does how does it work they will they will make the surplus produce only available to the long table and then the priced produce will be available through the local food hub and the long so only the long table can see it on, that, on that's the... right that's right yeah yeah okay so do we have any other questions there's a really good conversation happening in the chat box um but if anyone has any questions for the group that'd be great but otherwise i could read out some of these 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 great comments nick um, nick sorry can you just share the tech side of how that happens so if you've got a producer um let's let's say it's top barn who um who who do our veg if they wanted to um donate uh veg to one of our new food hubs that we're setting up that is not the the jewelry quarter hub um how do they do that two ways kate one is that they could tag sorry there's some feedback your sound's gone funny can you hear me okay yep it's fine now great so there's two ways of doing that kate one is that they can tag the inventory variant to be visible only to certain uh, certain shop fronts um i can go into that in a bit more detail on the the drop-in session tomorrow if you want to do that the other way is that the producer could set up two separate enterprises they could set up an enterprise that is for surplus produce and an enterprise that's for paid produce and then they could give permission from the surplus produce only to certain shop fronts so there's two different ways of doing it Thank you.
Thanks for that, Nick. Is there any other questions? There's some great comments happening in the chat. Um, and there was one from Alice around, um, I think meeting people where they're at is important too. We tried to do different types of publicity leaflets in the community fridges with phone number on email schools, nurseries, etc. And there's some good comments around um, food dignity as well. But does anyone have any other questions for each other, the panelists, or any comments on the topic so far? Could I um, could I ask Rachel how her uh, the is it pay it forward with a veg veg box? How that how that works sort of practically? Is that is that a veg box you put together as one of your producers standard veg box? So uh, we have a, a veg bag option on the food hub. It's called our seasonal English veg bag. We sell it with potatoes and without potatoes. And then underneath we have a variant, which is a pay it forward option, buy a veg bag for a family in need. Um, and then it goes out through the various different routes that I was talking about earlier. Um, but yeah, we simply have it as a variant and also as a donation variant. Great, thanks. And it's, and it's all the same produce that goes in the same bag as paying customers bags. And is, um, just a separate question, is pay it forward a pretty commonly known phrase now, is it? Does everybody it, does it understand it when you when you when, it, when they see that, as opposed to donation? To be honest, I don't think we use that. I can't remember how we phrase it. Um, I think it might be phrased as buy a buy a veg bag for a family in need. It's along those lines rather than pay it forward. But I think pay it forward is becoming a much more common phrase now. That's that is kind of recognised. I had just a very quick follow-up question to that, Rachel. Um, how, uh, what sort of volume do you typically get in terms of pay it forward or you know uh, food poverty uh, boxes compared to your usual stuff? The, the, this month, it's really gone up quite a lot. Um, I think we're getting anywhere between kind of ten and twenty over the past month when we first, but it varies quite a lot, really, and varies depending on what week it is in the month. We find, you know, when we find that anyway, that we get fluctuations throughout the month and after everyone's got paid, our orders go up and about the third week of, of November, they, they drop quite a bit and then they go up. So um, that, that kind of follows the donations pattern as well. Um, but yeah, our customers seem to be very engaged with, with the donations, which is, which is really nice. Um, and as I said, yeah, we can kind of kind of match fund projects that are brought to us with schools or, or housing associations, which is really nice. Um, I was going to ask a question about um, buying groups, because one of the things that we've been considering, but we haven't acted on yet, is trying to support the setup of, of buying groups so like communities of individuals can access food at lower prices because there's more of them <laughs> uh, doing it together um, and like I said we, we haven't set this up yet so this is more a question of if anybody has or has any experience of it working or maybe not working for various reasons um, because it's something we're quite keen to do both for people that it may make it easier for them to access food but also with different groups of people so being a university um, city we've been like talking with students and stuff you're quite keen of to be part of the food hub but we're like well actually we're a business to business um so we, we deal with like bigger orders and and stuff like that so it's something that's kind of been on our mind is something to look into but we haven't done yet so i wondered is there other people here if anyone had any kind of experience or knowledge in this area um i I think I can uh, come in here. Um, certainly uh, Warwick Uni, uh, when I was at Coventry, there was a group of students that had their own um, food talk. Um, and yeah, I mean, that might be relevant to what you were talking about. Um, 
yeah, where anyone can basically uh, join in, uh, not just students, which is very helpful for me as I got loads of cheap oats. Can I, can I chip in here as well, Alice? Um, let me turn my video off. Um, Louise is on this call and Louise has just helped us to set up um, a full product list from Essential Trading, uh, which is a whole food wholesaler based in Bristol, so very similar to Suma, which I think probably service Cambridge as well. Um, and Essential does service buying groups, so they will, they will, as long as you can make up a minimum order of £250, then they will, um, they will deliver sacks, you know, 25 kilo sacks of rice and pasta mm -hmm. and that sort of thing at wholesale prices. Um, and so we're in the process of setting up our first buying group using that Essential um, product list. We hope to do the same with the Suma list and possibly Infinity and Brighton as well, um, so that the buying groups can then place the whole food a wholesale order at wholesale prices and then divide up that order amongst amongst the members. So I'm happy to talk to you more about that. Yeah, um, thanks, Nick. No, that's that's really helpful. That's exactly the kind of idea. And I'm not sure. Oh, here we go. I thought it was Lynn. It sounded like Lynn. Um, I, I completely appreciate about the bottom up nature of them. And this is definitely not something that we want to impose on anyone. It's just that we think that it could be a good thing to suggest or support and um i don't know i just wanted to get some kind of more knowledge on that so yeah but i definitely agree about it having to be bottom up i'm not going to enforce buying groups on anyone but i think sometimes people don't know like i was on a panel event with some students recently and i don't think they'd really considered the idea of it so i just thought maybe i could suggest this and it's something they could look into and try Definitely worth a try and give us a shout if you'd like help setting it up. Question in the chat from um, Jade to Nick, and that is, is, uh, is the SUMA essential list for all over the UK or just for Stroud? The essential list is currently just being uploaded by Louise. It's a massive product list. So we used the product, product upload feature to get it in there and Louise did a great job. We're trialing it with one uh, food co-op in Stroud. Uh, they're just about to put their first order in. Um, assuming that goes well, then it will be made available to everybody across the UK. Uh, the SUMA list isn't in yet, but we're, so we are talking to SUMA and we're also talking to Infinity. But yeah, the plan was to make it UK wide. Just a follow up point from Alice on that one is that it would be good um, to have that for other wholesalers. So, are there any other questions in the chat? Because we've got a couple more minutes. Um, no, does anyone have any other questions for the group? Any other topics they want to talk about? Um, I, I suppose my one was just, you know, should we be taking out food vouchers or not? Um, uh, has anybody got any thoughts on that, or should we be entering into a food voucher type scheme? I'm, I'm, I guess I'm talking from both a, I guess there's a financial perspective. There's also a food poverty perspective, but also a sort of ethical perspective as well. And I think it's that one that I'm particularly struggling with at the moment. If anybody's got any words of wisdom on that, please. I'd be really interested to hear. Um, I'm definitely up for speaking to this. Um, yeah, I mean, you said, Tom, that your alternative or your ideal world would be to raise wages um, and without having the power to raise wages, which is obviously, you know, there's no such thing as food poverty, there's just poverty. So, um, but I guess for all of us, you know, we are engaged in a space of kind of trying to find uh you know sticking plaster solutions to systemic issues and if we can provide some sticking plasters alongside the other alongside the systemic work that we're doing then that's an awesome thing um yeah and food vouchers you know like i think one of the nice things about doing food vouchers with the ability to um coordinate via online is that they can be done with a lot of dignity we're doing a voucher scheme at the moment with tamar actually uh that um basically it'll be quite targeted through uh through different projects um you know working in poverty related issues uh but 
there's no at no point will anyone ever have a physical voucher they'll just get to check out and it'll be 15 pounds cheaper than it would have been otherwise and they know that that's going to happen but like there's a full choice of all of the food there's like you know there's a lot of those aspects of dignity it's exactly the same stuff exactly the same food um but uh yeah without kind of having to do any of the steps in there that are like handing over a voucher or feeling ashamed about uh, you know this is the intention at least so um yeah I think that personally I think vouchers can do a lot of good in our sticking plaster worlds um uh yeah cool. thanks Lynn that's very well I put the chats in the comment box as well Lynn when yeah. when you say they end um they get to the the checkout and it's 15 pounds cheaper um how are you funding that um yeah so this is coming from a funded piece of work and i think this is one of the challenges that we you know how do we fund these kind of things ongoing in an ongoing way so we're fortunate to have some funding for this project and we're using it to do a little bit of research alongside uh, to support, you know, like what are the barriers to accessing this good food? Because we often talk about money as one of the barriers, but money is only one of the many barriers of accessing food through a platform like the Open Food Network. So if we can remove the money barrier, we can have conversations about the other barriers, what was terrible and difficult and what was easy and joyful. Um, so it's a funded piece of work that's kind of, been funded for uh and we're shoehorning this onto it but i guess the other ways it could be some of these pay it forward donations you know like take a donation and then there's this much money to allocate but then how do you do that targeting mm -hmm. uh it's it's a very difficult set of questions to do that targeting for vouchers um do they just go to everyone in which case should you just lower your prices or do you want to try and identify the right people what does that even mean? Um, who is best placed to identify those people, um, etc. cetera. Is, is there anybody within the group um, here who is taking Healthy Start vouchers um, that I could actually talk to, not now, but maybe off, off the call? Um, we do, and I guess Rachel as well. Yeah, I could talk to you about uh, a local CSA project that takes them, Kate. Okay, that's fantastic. Um, I actually need to get going because it's our hub collection tonight. So um, it's been really fantastic listening to what everybody else is doing. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming, Kate, and for your, yeah, your amazing share. So thanks. Thanks again. And this actually brings us slightly past time. Um, so yeah, so wrapping up, Thank you so much to all of our speakers and thanks to everyone that, that came today. This is going to be, um, record, this has been recorded and will be uploaded into the event spaces on Facebook and on YouTube as well. So if anyone wants to watch the recording, um, it will be there um, next week. And yeah, so thanks everyone for coming and hope to see you at the next webinar.